Hello. Okay, we're just given a few minutes. If you've just walked in um, and your, your language is not English, you're not good in English, you can go outside in the lobby and give them your ID and they'll give you an earpiece with a translation into your language of choice so that you can understand my presentation. We're just given a couple of minutes for everybody to come back in with their, uh, their translation boxes. I see a few people there just came back in. We'll just give a couple more minutes. Do we know if there's anyone out in the lobby still? Jose? Is there anyone still trying to get the translation pieces? Okay, two more minutes. Um, I guess I'll just, uh, I just wanna say to everybody that uh, that last session was really, really nice. Uh, you know, having a, a, a women's organization. Uh, back in the States, I think that 85% uh, of all the people that cultivate are men, and uh, not so many women, but that's changing. And uh, organizations like the one that was just up here, and we have one called Women Grow in the United States. And uh, I enjoy teaching women how to grow. Women are natural nurturers, and uh, men can be a little heavy-handed. Uh, women make really good growers. They're very, uh, very attentive. And uh, I actually must say that uh, uh, some of the best growers that I've ever trained were women that picked it up the very first time around and grew amazing yields because they, uh, they were willing to allow the plant to do its own thing. Men can be a little bit, do what I say. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to make you do this. And uh, you can't make a plant do anything. Uh, well, uh, what I mean by that is that uh, a plant, you can't rush anything. You can't force feed it. You can't force it to drink more water. Um, you can't force it to finish faster. It's all about patience. You have to be patient with uh, plants. And you have to uh, learn their cycle. So um, I'm going to begin now. Uh, welcome everybody and thank you for coming. My name is Kyle Cushman. Uh, you may have heard of me. I was a staff journalist with High Times Magazine for around 10 years and um, I moved to California about 10 or 11 years ago in the United States from New York where cannabis was illegal to where it was not illegal. And uh, I began uh, growing as a legal farmer for the first time in my life after being illegal for many, many years, and that was very stressful. Uh, moving around every six to eight months, trying to stay away from the police, police and, um, and developing my style. And then I moved to California and I didn't have to run anymore. So I was, I was allowed to grow in my home, and that's what really uh, changed everything for me. So I understand that uh, we have the right to grow cannabis here in Spain. Um, it's, it's a new industry. And so I'm here to tell you uh, a little bit about how I grow medical marijuana. And when I say medical marijuana, basically all I mean is that uh, when you use the word medicine, medicine is supposed to be good for you. So make sure that the cannabis that you grow is good for you. Because just because it gives you a feeling up here doesn't mean that it's actually good for you in here. Um, the same kind of thing with vegetables or meat or food that you put in your body. Just because it fills your stomach and you're not hungry anymore, it doesn't mean that it's actually good for you. It could be actually bad for you. And it's the same thing with cannabis. So I call cannabis medicine and I like to make sure that everything that I use is actually good for me. And one of the ways I do that is uh, by growing veganically. So as you can see behind me on the screen, it says, what is veganics? Well, everybody out here is familiar with the term organic. And I live a primarily organic lifestyle. Um, that doesn't mean I don't ever eat a McDonald's burger or something like that, but when I go to the supermarket, I buy organic eggs and organic cheese and organic bread and organic meat because I believe that uh, if we are going to uh, 
live off the land. We need to uh, leave it in, in the same way that we left it. So organic farming is extremely important to me. Now, veganics is kind of the next step. I like to say, take the poop out your pot. So I don't use any animal excrement, no animal byproducts whatsoever, no bone meal, no blood meal. Um, these are slaughterhouse products. These come from slaughterhouses, from factory farms. And so a long time ago, when the earth was a lot cleaner, the stuff that came out of the back ends of the animals was a lot cleaner. It wasn't loaded with antibiotics and hormones and pesticides and all of these things that uh, we feed to the animals now and it builds up as an aggregate toxicity. And then we till it back into the soil and it goes back into our food source and that's why our food sources are continuing to degrade. Now, you have to understand I'm speaking from an American viewpoint. And in America, um, we're doing a really good job of poisoning our earth. We use way too many chemicals, um, way too many synthetics. Uh, uh, we recently just voted against putting a label on our food that would tell people whether they were genetically modified or not. The people who, uh, who run these large organizations found a way to advertise and convince people that they don't want to know what's on their labels because it would increase the price of their food, as if putting a label and telling people what they've put in it is actually going to make things more expensive. What it's going to do is it's going to cut their profit margin because people won't want to buy it. But America is a very, very big country, and the liars have gotten very talented. The liars really know how to get their message across, and a lot of times people who are good people were not as loud and not as vocal, and we're not willing to do or say anything to make people believe us or hear our point. But the other people are willing to do or say anything. So I discovered veganics. I didn't invent veganics. It fell into my lap. I discovered it. And veganics means vegan organic. So everything we use is organic, but there's no animal byproducts. And what that does is it gives you an extremely clean product at the end. Virtually every person who tries uh, veganics says it's the cleanest cannabis they've ever tasted in their life. And that's because of the diet. You are what you eat. And um, I use an analogy. I don't know if it'll work here too well, but back in America, we have a holiday called Thanksgiving. And I'm sure you've heard of it. In Thanksgiving, everybody sits around and you have a big feast. And everybody eats a lot. You eat a lot of turkey and a lot of pies and, and you eat a lot. And then everybody sits back on the couch and everybody's all tired because they have to digest all this food. Well, I also like sushi. And if you like sushi, you know you can go out to a sushi restaurant and you can gorge yourself on sushi. No matter how much you eat, 15 minutes later you feel energy. It's because the protein in the sushi is very easily assimilated. And that's kind of the difference between veganic nutrition and organic nutrition. Organic nutrition must be broken down. It needs to decompose. It needs to be chelated and broken down before the plants can actually use it. Veganic nutrition is 100%, nearly 100% bioavailable from the moment you introduce it into the media, into the soil or the rock wool or the pellets. So they expend very little energy getting the nutrition inside the plant. It's the same thing as I just said with the food. If you eat some very hard food that needs to break down, your body has to make all these digestive enzymes and it has to expend energy to extract the nutrition from the food. With veganic nutrition, it's like a wheatgrass smoothie. You go and get that wonderful wheatgrass with all those vitamins, you drink it down, and you instantly get a burst of energy. That's the difference between veganic nutrition and organic nutrition. I actually believe that veganics is the evolution of organic horticulture. Veganic horticulture is the only method of organic horticulture that has 0% chance of cross-contamination of pathogens like E. coli, salmonella, uh, these things that, again, in America, every now and then, every few years, we'll get a food recall from these pathogens that are in our food. Um, sometimes it's even vegetables. They've even had to recall spinach that was put in bags and sold to supermarkets because the spinach was sold down the road from a, far from a cow farm. And the, the, the owner of the farm would drive from one farm to the other and pick up microbes from the inside of the cow's belly and now drive over here and then water flows and flows over the spinach and now you have E. coli on your spinach. So 
I'm not trying to, pardon the pun, poo-poo on organics. Organics is wonderful outdoors. But when you bring a plant indoors and you put it in a confined space, you put it in a pot. Put my hands over here so you can see me. So when you put the plant into a pot and then you put poop in the pot, well, once the plants remove the nutrition from the animal poop, what are you left with? Poop. There's residue left over. And that's what I'm talking about with veganics. It's residue free. Everything you put in gets metabolized. With, with veganic nutrition, once the plant removes the nutrition from the product, you're left with nothing but complex carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates in turn feed your beneficial organisms, and now you're left with a near neutral soil that's lowest in salts and virtually undetectable levels of heavy metals. We had our produce tested in the United States at labs for heavy metals, and it came back all zeros. And this lab that does these tests all the time had never gotten a test with zero for cannabis before. So they had to go back and recalibrate their machines to parts per billion, not parts per million, parts per billion with a B. And we found that veganic cannabis had between 30 and 300 parts per billion of heavy metals, as opposed to uh, one part per million or a half of a part per million. So we're at 10,000 times less than what is actually allowed by the USDA in organic food. And that's because we're not using these slaughterhouse products. This bone meal and blood meal and guanos, that's where all these heavy metals congregate. That's where they all build up. So it's very low in heavy metals and it produces an extremely clean product that you can actually taste and that your throat will tell you. Um, when I, uh, if occasionally I smoke other people's cannabis nowadays and it's not strictly organic, I get a rasp, I get a burn on the back of my throat. Veganic cannabis is extremely smooth. It's the smoothest tasting cannabis that I've ever tasted in my life. Here is the, uh, the heavy metals test results. And this is, a, this is a test that we did about a year ago. And you can see from the bottom to the top, it's zero for mercury, zero for lead, 0 0.03 parts per million, and 0 0.03 parts per million of cadmium and arsenic. And then just recently, we redid the test again. And that's when we got the zeros, and it came back in parts per billion. So even at 0 0.03 parts per million, that is still a thousand times lower than allowed by the USDA in an organic peach that you're allowed to eat. So veganic medicine is extremely clean, and you can both taste it and you can tell in the tests <clears throat> that you do on it as well, because it's not going to have any of these residues left. So. I have wanted to include some pictures of uh, some gardens that I consult on back in the United States. And as you can see, um, all the plants are very even. And that's very important because uh, consistency is your friend when you grow. Whether you have four plants or six plants or 10 plants or 100 plants, you want an even canopy because then you can bring your lights down lower and the plants are gonna continue growing evenly and you're not gonna have dips in your canopy with three or four plants that don't get any light and don't produce. So use pruning techniques and bending and training techniques to try, try to have a nice even canopy. And what I'm also uh, pointing out here is that I like to grow in a soilless medium, um, which is a mixture of sphagnum, sphagnum peat, and cocoa core. Um, if you use all sphagnum, your medium will be a little bit too waterlogged. And if you use cocoa, <clears throat> it won't hold quite enough water. So I like a mixture of both. And we have a product uh, that's called Premier Pro Mix that I'm pretty sure is available worldwide. And it's pretty economical. Um, and it comes in large 3.2 cubic foot bales, not these little bags of soil that are very expensive. So I don't know um, if you've ever heard of Premier Pro Mix, but that's the soil that I choose to use. And <clears throat> After you choose a medium, the next most important thing is lighting. And as you can see in this picture, I don't know if you can tell, but those lights are on a mover. So up, up at the top there, you can see the, 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 the light mover right up at the top. And it, these lights are actually moving side to side across the room. They're not moving typically uh, vertically like this. And so I had to build a special trapeze with a light mover at each end 
and a trapeze so that the lights will go back and forth across my room. And what this does is it allows me to keep the lights lower because the light intensity is not sitting in one spot and it's not building up heat. The lower your lights, the more the light intensity, the higher the yield you're going to get. But once you put your lights low and they're stationary, they'll burn certain spots on the plants. So light movers are a really effective way, not of increasing the canopy space. Some people think that light movers are so that you can have more plants, so that you can move the lights over a larger space. That's not, that's not the way that I use light movers. I'm using a light mover simply so that I can take my lights. In this case, I have two rails with four lights on each attached to a trapeze, and they move 18 inches off center back and forth like this, back and forth the whole day, so that they're never in one spot so that the lights can be kept closer. And if you notice, these are mirrored reflectors. If you look in the middle ones, you can see the green plants reflecting into the light. So those are actual mirrors. So I'm getting 100% reflection. And you could not use mirrored reflectors in a stationary position because you would literally have burn spots. So I'm using an extremely efficient reflector, a mirror, and I'm moving them very slowly back and forth. And that's why I get these really huge colas. The other thing I want to say about lighting is, is I don't know how, prof how uh, common using metal halide is. Many people choose to use only one light, the high pressure sodium, and that is acceptable. You can, obviously, you can grow plants and you can flower plants under a sodium light. But now we're afforded the, the, uh, the luxury of having digital ballasts. Digital ballasts run virtually any bulb you buy. So you don't have to buy a separate set of ballasts. When I was starting off 20 years ago, I used to have to carry around a halide ballast and a sodium ballast, and they each weighed about 40 pounds. So if I had a 10 light system, I had 20 ballasts. So every time I moved, I used to have to load hundreds of pounds of ballasts into a car and move them. Now you don't have to do that because the digital ballasts run different voltages and they run different lights. The benefit of halide is, now halide more mimics uh, natural sunlight in, in the early part of the season. As you know, as the summer goes on, the spectrum of the light changes. Early summer, it's more of a white-blue light. And then as you get towards the fall, the sun is a lot more orange. And that's, where we, that's why we flower under a sodium light. We flower under the orange light. But if a plant has not seen sodium light until the point in which you actually want to turn it into flowering, in other words, you vegetate the plant under the blue-white of halide, and it never sees that sodium until the night you switch the lights back for the first time, you're going to get a more pronounced bud set. Bud set means the time it takes from the time you switch the lights off for the first time to the time the plant stops stretching. Now, stretching is a problem because you can flower a plant at two feet and end up with four-foot tall plant. You're trying to have a compact bud canopy. You want all the buds in your plants to be within about an 18-inch space because that means that they're receiving intense light. Buds that are much lower and much farther away from the light, they don't develop, they don't get hard, they don't get color. They're soft, spongy, kind of leafy. So try to clean your plants up so that the plant's not wasting energy on that lower larfy stuff, as we call it, and it sh pushes all of its energy up to the colas, and now you get fatter colas. So by pruning the plant, you're actually getting the same yield, but you're getting more, um, uh, you're getting a higher quality flowers because you're not messing with the little tiny popcorn buds all the way down low beneath. So think of it like this. Every plant has a finite amount of energy. So if it has 150 budding sites on that plant, it's going to divide its energy among those 150 budding sites. If you take off 30 or 40 of the lower budding sites, it still has the same amount of energy. So now it's going to push that energy up towards the mature flowers. So you're going to get the same yield, the same overall weight, but you're going to have much nicer flowers, much nicer buds, and larger colas. Um, So this is just a picture of the light rail without the lights there. And you can see there's two, two rails going uh, vertically like this. And then at one end and at the other end, there is a horizontal light mover. And then you hang the carriage from that. So typically, people hang a light mover 
and you just move the lights back and forth like this. But I say, why move the lights over there when there's already another light down there? So if I'm hanging my lights this way, I want my movers to go this way because there's no lights there and there's no lights there. So it takes a little bit of ingenuity, but it's very, very beneficial if you can move your lights horizontally across the can canopy rather than in the line with the lights because you'll still get the benefit of being able to move the lights, but you'll get extra benefit by moving the lights to a place where there are no lights over the plants. Uh, this is, you can see this is like a 16 light room with two eight light movers on them. And all of these lights are moving in unison horizontally back and forth. And as you can see, those are thousand watt lights and they're only about two feet above the canopy. Um, so you keep the, the room cool and you're getting very, very intense light, and that's how you get very, very, very fat colas. Um, and the other thing that's very important, obviously, is environmental control. And this is something that you have to buy appliances for. You know, you need dehumidifiers to make sure that humidity doesn't go high too, too high. Um, people ask me how to not get mold, you know, uh, bud mold. Um, you want to make sure that at night, when you turn your lights out, you have a dehumidifier that can keep the humidity in your room below 40%. Molds do not like, will not grow, grow very well in, a, in an environment with lower than 40% humidity. So if you don't have dehumidifiers, at night when your plants respire, they give off all that water that they've been taking off all day, the humidity shoots up really high, 70%, 75%, that's very, very bad. You're never gonna succeed. So you need some kind of hum dehumidifiers. Whenever you're buying appliances, whether it's an air conditioner, whether it's a dehumidifier, whether it's fans, always try to buy a size larger than you think you need. This will make the appliance last longer. If you always have to run your dehumidifier or your air conditioner on max high, you're gonna burn it out much quicker. So spend a little bit more money and buy the next size up and it'll last a lot longer. Environmental control also includes um, making sh if you get an environmental controller with a day-night set point, some of them have what's called an electronic eye, and it'll know whether it's day or night. And what that allows you to do is you plug your air conditioner into there, you plug your dehumidifier into there, and you can have a different set point for your day and your night. So, for example, during the daytime, it's perfectly acceptable to be 75 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know how to convert that into Celsius. I'll assume that that's 25 or 30 degrees Celsius, let's say. But at night, you want to bring the temperature down by 10 degrees because that's what happens in nature. In nature, it gets colder at night. The closer you can mimic nature, the more organic your flowers are going to be, the better they're going to taste. So you want to have control, complete control over your environment, and you want to have monitors so that you can come in in the morning and check and see what was my humi humidity overnight? What was my temperature overnight? Do I want to bring it down a little bit more? Your temperature at night should be 10 degrees cooler than your daytime temperature. That's the optimal. And that will give you the best tasting flowers. Also what happens is your root structure heats up. So if it's constantly 85 degrees, What's a warm temperature in Celsius? Someone shout out a warm summertime temperature in Celsius. 28. Okay, so 28 is a warm day, and that's what your grow room is. You don't want it 28 degrees at night. You want it down to 22 degrees at night. So you want the control both to be able to know that you need to adjust it, and you need the control to be able to do that separate temperature at night. So look for appliances that will allow you to have a separate day and night set point for both your humidity and your temperature. As much control as you can have over your environment, you're mother nature. You're now bringing these plants inside. And so you have to control the light, the temperature, the watering, it's all up to you. And the more, con more precise control you have over it, the better growing experience you will have. The more you're running around to try to make things perfect, the less perfect your growing experience is going to be and the more problems you're going to have and that you could possibly run into. Photo period. Photo period means how many hours of the day is the light on and is the light off. 
So there's many photo periods that people like to use. Some people use 24 hours on for vegetative. Some people use 18 hours on for vegetative. I like to use 20 hours on for vegetative. 20 hours on and four hours off. When you leave the lights on at 28 degrees for two, three weeks at a time, the root structure heats up. The soil heats up to the same temperature as the air. And roots don't like that. So it's really good to give it a little break at night to let the temperature come down. The plants will grow much faster and they will respond. And your root structure will grow much faster as well. Your root structure is your highway. The wider the highway, the faster you can drive. The, the more prolific, the more roots you have, the faster your plants can grow. So pay attention to the root zone as much as you pay attention to the leaf zone. You want to have a, a thriving, healthy root zone, and you want to do things to make your plants grow. So I think that giving them a little rest at night uh, definitely helps grow the roots. Um, and the other thing is, like I said, I believe in going right from uh, 20 hours on and four hours off of blue halide. And then as soon as the plants get to the height that you want, remembering that plants will, when you flower them, they'll go anywhere from one, they'll double in size to triple in size. So you have to take that into account, you know, what, how big your grow room is. If you have a tall room like the one pictured here, well, I can flower six foot plants. I don't have to worry about that because I have a 10 foot ceiling. But if you only have an eight foot ceiling or a six foot ceiling, you have to make sure that you flower your plants much smaller. Now you can flower your plants anytime you want. You can flower a plant that's four inches tall. When you flower the plant is going to determine the yield. You flower a four inch plant, you might get a half an ounce or an ounce. You flower a six inch plant, now you're gonna get a couple of ounces. You flower a one foot plant, you're getting up to a quarter pound. You flower a two foot plant, you're getting up to a six ounce plant. So the size at which you flower it ultimately determines your finished yield along with other factors, how healthy you keep the plant. But obviously, you're not going to get a pound off of a plant that you flower this big. But if you flower a plant that's two, three feet tall, it's very possible you could get a pound off of it. Um, did I want to say anything else about photo period? Um, so yes, so I think the most beneficial thing is to use metal halide every day, 20 hours on, four hours off, until the plant gets to the size at which you want to flower it. And then you turn the lights back to 12 and 12, 12 hours off, 12 hours on. You install the sodium lights, and your bud set happens overnight. You'll see the little hairs coming out. Sometimes I see them in 24 to 48 hours. They begin to flower because they've been shocked. When you change the photo period to a flowering photo period, you're shocking the plants into thinking that winter is coming. That's why they flower. They want to flower and make seed because they want to perpetuate the species. Well, you double shock them by changing the, the spectrum, the light spectrum. So not only are they seeing darkness for the first time, but they also see this orange late fall sun, and they think that winter is going to be here tomorrow, and they flower very, very quickly. So there's much less stretching, and you get much less internodal spacing, so you get bigger flowers. That's how I grow big, fat colas like that. Halide for, for vegging, sodium for flowering, and uh, 24 hours, if you, if you like a 24-hour photo period, I suggest that it's only good for the first couple of weeks, and then you're diminishing returns. You start getting diminishing returns for the hours you're, you're paying for electricity because the plants kind of need a little break in there. They need time. Their leaves come up all day, and when the lights go out, the leaves come down. And when the leaves come down, the oil pressure in the plant comes down. Everything that's been going up the stalk, water and nutrients, well, there's, there's byproducts. From every biological function, including plants, there's a waste product from all the biological functions. Well, the rest time is time for them to come down and it reverses the pressure and the root exudates. It's called root exudates. That's the garbage that's left over from all the biological processes are allowed to be flushed out of the roots and into the soil. And I believe it's those root exudates that makes the soil tomato taste so much better than the hydroponic tomato. Has anybody ever tasted a hydroponic tomato that tasted anything like one that came out of soil? Because I haven't. 
So that's why I grow my cannabis in soil as well, because there's a lot of functions taking place in there that just in, in, in impart flavors and, uh, and potency that you can't get in the hydroponic. Hydroponic has a, a bling, but if you've ever tried to cure hydroponic weed for three or six months, there's nothing left. You cure organic weed, and it just gets better and better and better. Six months, nine months, 12 months, it just keeps getting better and better. It has a soul to it because it was grown in the soil and it has a lot more compounds in it for that reason. <clears throat> So, here you can see a picture of a very large leaf. Now that plant was grown indoors, under lights, and on the left there, that's a picture of a, of a seed plant. And the way you can tell that is the two little round leaves, the, those little pod busters they're called, they're called cotyledons. And uh, that's how you can tell that that is a seed and, and not a clone. Um, Seeds, seed plants, will always be superior to a clone plant in several ways. It's going to be stronger and more resistant to disease and, and pests. It's going to grow faster. And um, it's going to have a potential for a higher yield. It's kind of like mother's milk. Everybody knows that mother's milk is very good for the baby. It imparts uh, um, uh, disease resistance and vitamins. And, uh, and that's what the seed does. The seed contains an embryo, and in that embryo is very important um, compounds that help nourish that seed and get it going. The farther you get away from seed, in other words, the clone, the more generations a plant has been cloned, the more susceptible it becomes to disease and pests and things like that. And so I encourage everybody to, at some point, grow from seed. Now, you do have to deal with males, but it's very easy to tell males from females. And um, growing from seed is a, is, is a way different experience than growing from clones. They just, they're, they're, they're like mutants. They grow, they're monstrous. Seed plants are monstrous compared to clone plants, what they do. It's, uh, it's, it's really amazing. The root soil food web is extremely important when growing organically or veganically. Um, the root soil food web is when you uh, inoculate the soil with mycorrhiza, endomycorrhiza, and beneficial fungi. And these little organisms, um, they do a lot of the work for the plant. They make it, make it easier for the plant to take the food in. And again, you can't do this in hydroponics. This is only for bio or, or organics or veganics. So my example is if you're ever sitting out in the sun, and you lean back and you kind of close your eyes and you see that little one-celled amoeba crawl across your eyeballs, it kind of swims across your eye, well, that's a beneficial microbe. And if you didn't have those microbes on your eyeballs, you'd go blind. And we have these beneficial microbes all over our body that keep us healthy. Well, there's a symbiotic relationship between beneficial microbes and plants. They can't live without them. They're present in nature. So what we do is we, in we consistently inoculate to raise the level of beneficial microbes from thousands of units per, per centimeter to millions of units per centimeter. The more of these little microbes you have, the more uh, conversions of nutrients. Uh, they eat dead root mass. They convert dead, mushy brown roots into usable nitrogen. So they, they also clean the cilia, the little fine hairs on the roots. They clean that and keep that clean so your plants can fully respire. So building a healthy root soil food web. Um, you can do it with, with instant teas, or you can do it with compost teas. People brew teas, and that's where you get your beneficial organisms from. And it's very important to do this at least once a week in your organic media. There's really, really good instant teas that you can buy now um, so that you don't have to have bubbling buckets of brew around. Um, but if you do have space and you live in the country and you're a do-it-yourselfer, I highly encourage you know, buying or making some compost and making your own compost tea. Um, I like to use compost tea in three different ways. There is uh, granular. The granular stuff is extremely inexpensive. You can buy it at any nursery or garden store. And they sell it in big sacks by the pound. 
$20 for 20 pounds, and you put a few tablespoons in the hole in the root ball before you put the roots on top, and now the roots have direct contact with these microbes, and it helps them gr grow much faster. So that's the granular. Every time I transplant, I put a little bit in the soil. And then you have your soluble. Your soluble is water soluble. So every time I mix up a batch of water, I put a little bit in there, and so I constantly inoculate and keeping my, my root soil food web very, very vibrant. The third way is called a biofilm. So what you do is you brew some microbe tea, and you put it into a pump sprayer, full strength, and you spray it on the exterior of the plants. So much like the beneficial tea that you pour into the water, into the root zone, it provides like a secondary immune system. It does the same thing on the outsides of the plant. So for example, if a mold spore happens to fly into your room and land on your plants, these beneficial microbes are gonna be like, hey, this is our land and they're gonna attack it and they're going to kill it. So before it has a chance to propagate and take hold, that mold spore will get kicked out and killed. Foliar, yes. So three ways, you've got the granular in the soil, you've got the soluble, which you re-inoculate every time you water or at least once per week. So there's a lot of ways to use things, you know? So if the, if the product says use it once a week at, at a teaspoon per gallon, I'll use it every time I water at a half a teaspoon per gallon. I like to use it every time. Um, Vega Matrix, the nutrient system that I developed that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, I made it very simple so that you can feed with every watering. It's a very low NPK, so you don't have to guess. That's one of the hardest things is you go in your room, first you have to figure out, do I need to water? Learning how and when to water is one of the most key important things to becoming a good farmer. You water too much or too little, the plants don't grow well. The next thing is to know when you have to feed the plant. So what I did was I, I invented a fertilizer system that you can feed with every single watering. You just follow the feeding chart, you put a little bit of grow, a little bit of bloom, a little bit of boost according to what stage of growth you're in, and you feed with every watering so there's no guesswork. I think that that takes a lot of the guesswork out and makes it a lot easier for people. All you gotta do is figure out when to water. And watering, I call it cycling. Cycling means I go from fully wet, fully saturated, to fully dry. You want to, at some point when you're growing, you want to let your plants wilt. You want to let them wilt a little bit. And the way you'll, the reason you want to do that is because you want to be able to lift that pot up and by allowing it to go a little too far once, you'll see how light that pot can actually get before the plant actually wilts. If you're constantly watering that plant, the roots don't have any need to search out and grow for the water, so you'll have a smaller root system, and if you overwater, the plants will also be waterlogged and they won't grow as well. So you wanna learn how to cycle the plants, let them completely dry to the point where they're almost going to wilt, and then you resaturate the whole bucket again. So you go from full saturation to fully dry, and that way you'll, uh, you'll also, uh, you won't encourage molds and you won't encourage bugs because the media is not always fully saturated. Did I see a question out there somewhere? We have a question in the audience. Hola. Yeah, um, about this microorganism and, and all this that you were talking about. Uh, in the flowering state, it's, it's useful also? Because yes, absolutely. Absolutely. There are, there are certain mycorrhiza that are not helpful in flowering um, so that you can put them in there and, and it'll be a bit of a waste. So the whole consortium that you buy in a tub, all of it isn't going to be used, but it is very important to continue to re-inoculate all through flowering until you get to the flushing. Okay. And uh, what moment would you recommend to let your plants, let's say, a little bit dry and mm -hmm. feel this uh, dryness? You want to do that every cycle. Now, what I'm suggesting is that when the plants are, you first start your plants and there's no fruit on the plants, they're only vegetating. You've seen, anybody who's grown, if you accidentally go away and you come back and the plant's a little bit wilted, you water it in an hour or so, it comes right back. So this is the time when you want to uh, educate yourself on what it takes to make the plant wilt, how far you can go. Not when the plants have flowers on the plant, that's much more damaging. 
So you'll learn based on the size of the pot you're using and the size of your plant how far they can go. So in the vegetative state, experiment with letting it go very dry. Maybe one time even letting a plant wilt and then you can lift, you go, oh wow, that's really light. Okay, I can wait. As the plant matures and as you've developed the root structure, you don't need to let the plant dry out completely anymore. You wanna go about 75%. 25% wet, 75% dry so that you're still cycling the plants and you can give it a good amount of water on top. Okay, thank you. And my last question about what you was telling at the first about uh, cutting the down branches of the plant. Mm -hmm. What moment would you suggest to do this? After, let, let's say, when you change, when you switch the time at this moment or waiting a little bit more? Sure, that was my next slide. So I call it super cropping. That's a phrase that I coined a number of years ago when I was writing for High Times. For me, super cropping is any technique that enhances yield. That, that, that improves your yield. So earlier I was talking about um, removing nodes, and I didn't mention the word branches, but you should also remove lower branches that will never grow to the top of the canopy as well. There's usually two or three branches at the bottom of the plant that are just, I call them sucker branches. I call them sucker branches because all they do is suck energy from the plant. They're not really gonna produce any, they're trying to. So I used to do it a lot more when I lived with my garden and my garden was my life. I literally used to um, prune a half a dozen times to get to the point where I wanted. But I found uh, over the years that if you only prune twice, if you prune once, uh, somewhere in late veg, now see everybody veges differently. Some people veg for two weeks, some for four weeks, some for eight weeks. So if you, uh, if you wait until the plant is nice and robust and it's full, and as soon as you clean up the lower stuff, the in, inner, inner nodes and all the inner leaves, and make it so you can kind of, there's some airflow going through the plant, and you're just leaving the tops of the branches. Now sometimes I've literally gone in when I know that I want to grow a four-foot tall plant, four, five-foot tall plant. And I've been vegging now for two or three weeks and I have a nice, round, full plant with lots of leaves and branches. When you go in and you clean that up, I clean it up all the way to the tip, meaning that every node, all you have is a branch and a leaf and a leaf and a leaf and a leaf. I leave the leaves but take every node all the way to the tip of the plant. What happens is the next day that plant starts shooting up like crazy because it's not feeding all of those nodes below, it's only feeding the tip. So all that energy, it just starts to grow two inches a day. It was growing a half an inch a day, now it's growing two inches a day. So if you clean it up too early, you start forcing that vertical growth. Another thing you don't wanna do is, you don't wanna clean half your garden and leave the other garden because the ones that you cleaned will start growing much faster than the other ones. So when you get in there to clean up those nodes, do them all. If you can't do them all in one day, make sure to do the small plants first. If you clean up the big plants first, they're just going to get even bigger than the smaller plants. So you clean up the small plants the first day, and go back in and clean up the larger plants the second day. What I suggest is around a week before flowering, okay, whether you've vegged for two weeks or three weeks, you're about a week before flowering, that's when I go and I clean the plant up. I only leave three nodes at the top of each branch. Every node below that, I pinch off. Leaving the leaves, I leave the leaves because the leaves are solar collectors. And even, then they're, even though they're only collecting secondary light, they're still feeding energy to the roots. Now the roots are growing more. If you remove all the leaves all the way up to the top of the plant, including the nodes, the plant's gonna grow much slower because you have less solar panels. The more solar panels you have, the more energy you can collect. So leave the leaves, but remove the nodes. Clean the plant up several inches from the soil. Don't leave leaves that are touching the soil or close to the soil. Um, always remove any leaves that are yellow or brown or mottled. Damaged leaves, damaged vegetation attracts bugs. But bugs typically don't attack the healthy plants. They look for the weak plants. So they look for weak or dying vegetation. 
Don't leave dying vegetation in your room either. Always remove that from the, from the place. So one week before flowering, I clean them up. Now as you can see, this picture here on the left, it's kind of a close-up of the branches and it's all knotted and gnarled. And that's because what I did was I twisted and bent and braked it, broke it. And that's another form of super cropping. So what you can do is you can take a branch and you stabilize it with one hand and you twist in opposite directions and you'll hear a little click. That's the inner herd of the plant, the inner stalk snapping. And then you let go. The plant won't fall down, but what you've done is you've broken the inside of the plant. And if you've ever broken a bone in your life, you, the doctor will tell you you'll never break that bone in the same place again because it calcifies. It gets thicker than it was. Well, that's what I've done to this plant. I've made the branches th thicker than they normally would have been by snapping the inner herd, so now it holds more weight up. And on the interior, it actually has a wider highway to transfer water and nutrients up. Because the plant, you ever break a plant open, it has a hollow tube in the middle. The plants don't suck water and nutrients up through that tube, they actually pass it along cell to cell. So by increasing those cells, I've increased the highway. I have a wider highway, I can take more water and nutrients up. So that's the benefit of super cropping. Now as you can see on the picture on the right, you can kind of see that there are no nodes lower down on the branch. The only place that there are nodes are up near the tips. I thought I had another photo. Um, so here is an example of where I left the leaves, but I removed the nodes. Nodes is where a branch would be shooting out. So all the vegetation has been pinched where all those leaves are. There's no nodes all the way up to the very tip of the plant. So what I'm getting at is when I grow very large plants, I will clean the plant all the way up to the very tip. I'll only leave the very most growing tip. Every other node on the way down is pinched and removed. Within two weeks, the plant has grown another six to eight nodes. So there's your cola, there's your buds. Everything below, you don't want because that's just gonna be larfy undeveloped buds anyways. So don't be afraid to clean your plants up very, very heavily. Smaller plants, plants that are only gonna be one to two to three feet tall, leave three nodes. So from the tip, you'll leave one, two, three nodes and everything below that gets cleaned out. But leave the leaves because the leaves are energy collectors. And this is super cropping. And this is how you get large, long colas instead of getting a little bud at the top and then a popcorn and a popcorn and a popcorn. All of these things from using halide so that you get a quicker bud set and using these super cropping techniques will make it so that you have more prized, larger nuggets. And so you don't have to spend so much time trimming because trimming and cleaning these little tiny pieces are no fun either, right? Um, I did want to say, uh, oh, I'm going the wrong way here. Does this only go one way? Okay, so this is just another overview of several plants to show you how when you're done cleaning it, it kind of looks very bare and very sparse. But if you come back two weeks later, you won't be able to see that soil because the plants, the leaves will have grown back but all the energy will be towards the top of the plant and then you get really good airflow below. It lets your soil evaporate and it lets the, you water more often and you're not gonna grow any larfy buds. You're only gonna grow colas. Pruning and training. So the other thing you can do, so when you do the snapping technique to increase the, uh, the inner capillary action of the plants, you can decide to either release the plant and it'll just stay there or this is a chance for you to even out your canopy. So, so you're always gonna have some branches that are taller than the others. So as you're super cropping it, you can also bend it over and make it stay horizontal. So as you can see, some of these branches are horizontal and they stay like that. So what I've done is I've taken the larger, the larger branches and I've made the plant completely flat by bending over the larger branches. You find an open space here, you bend one over here. You bend one over here, and now it's even with all of the lower secondary branches, and now you have a bush. Because what happens is if you allow too many of the larger, uh, of the lead branches to grow a foot taller than the other ones, even though you've cleaned it up, you're still gonna have that lower larf. 
you want to have a nice, even canopy. And you can do that by manipulating. You can do that by tying. You see on the left plant, there's some green ribbon that's, tie that's wrapped around the plant, and I tie it down to the bucket. So I take my larger branches and pull it down so that it's now even with my secondary branches. And then your secondary branches become primary branches because if you get uh, direct light to the secondary branches, they grow just as fast as the other ones and you get more big buds. So again here, this is what you want your plant to look like when you put them into the room for flowering. Okay, these, these plants have not been cleaned up yet. Um, these are going, these are being stacked into the flowering room. They're going to be, all the lower leaves are going, leaves and, brand, and uh, nodes are going to be removed up to about 50% of the height of the plant. 50%, the 50 lower portion of the plant, you'll be able to see the back wall. You'll be able to see right through there. And that allows for good airflow and good evaporation so that you can water more often. I'm going the wrong way, I'm getting confused. I apologize. Okay, so this is just a picture of my thumb against a very hard stalk, a very thick stalk, and I just want to talk a little bit about water and water quality. Obviously, we want to give good water. Water can be dead or water can be alive. You want to enliven your water, okay? We all know from traveling in the woods, you know, you don't want to drink still water, right? If you're in the woods, you want to drink water out of a moving stream. Well, it's kind of the same thing. You don't want water that's been sitting in a barrel unaerated. You constantly want to aerate your water with an aquarium pump. And you also want to draw the water that you're going to use from your tap or from your source 24 to 48 hours ahead of time. Now, in America, there's a big reason for this. We put chlorine in our water. Um, and the chlorine will evaporate. Chlorine is a, uh, a bacteriocide. I was just talking about benef beneficial bacteria. If you add chlorine to your root zone, it doesn't know which bacteria is good and bad. It kills all bacteria. So you're going to kill your beneficial bacteria. So one of the ways you can avoid that is by drawing your water ahead of time and aerating it and allowing the chlorine to evaporate. Another good reason to draw your water ahead of time is you want it to come to an ambient room temperature. When you get in the shower, you don't jump in the cold water, right? You know how that feels? You jump in the cold water, it's a heck of a shock. It's the same thing if you pour really cold water onto your roots. It's a heck of a shock. And what happens is they stop growing temporarily. They get a shock, and then they'll slowly warm back up again, and then the plant rate of photosynthesis will come back up again. If, however, whenever you water, you water with temp tepid water, there's no shock, there's no slowdown. So you're trying to make the most of every day of growing. You know, you only get 12 hours of growth every day. So why would you want your plants to be shocked for two hours with cold water? So draw your water ahead of time and water with room temperature water. It's very, very beneficial. And that all leads to very good growth. IPM. Does anybody know what IPM is? Integrated Pest Management. That means take care of the bugs before you get them. Once you have an infestation, it's too late. So you, you, there's several methods that you can use to make sure that you don't get bugs. And we call it Integrated Pest Management. So on the right there is obviously a picture of a nasty bug of some sort. And in the center is a pump sprayer. The pump sprayer is the way that you're going to apply oils and natural ingredients that make it uh, unfavorable for, the, for, for bugs on the plants. So look for, um, they're called suffocants. Suffocants don't actually kill anything. They're non-toxic. What they do is they suffocate the, the bug. They make it so that they can't breathe. And more, more than that, what they really do is they make it so that they can't molt. Insects have stages of life. They start off as a pupa or a larva, and then they grow, and they have to molt their skin. They have to shed their skin, kind of like a butterfly has to shed and come out as something else. Well, if you put this oil on them, they can't molt, they can't become an adult, and they can't breed. So if you interrupt the breeding cycle, and you're consistent about spraying these oils, eventually the eggs that are there will hatch, but they won't be able to become adults, and they won't be able to become breeders, 
and you'll interrupt the breeding cycle and you won't have any more bugs. Whether it's spider mites, whether it's aphids, whether it's um, thrips, it all works. So look for, look for products that have geranium oil. Geranium oil is made from geraniums and it's a suffocant, it's inexpensive, it's usually combined with clove and cinnamon and other things like that, but geranium oil is really the ingredient you wanna look for and you spray that on your plants um, twice a week. If you spray that on your plants twice a week from the time they're established until you have flowers on the plants because we don't wanna spray oils on our flowers, you will have created an environment that's very detrimental to the bugs. There's a taste on there that they don't like when they bite into the stalk, and those oils will interrupt all your breeders, and you won't have an infestation of molds or bugs. The bag, the sachet, this little hanging bag on the left, I don't know if you can read it, it says Thripex Plus. These are beneficial um, predator mites. So you can use biologicals as well. So if you're already to the point where you know that you have some bugs, maybe it's not an infestation, look for a company that sells a bug that eats the bug that you have. They're called biologicals. And that's another way to organically eliminate the pests that you have by using biologicals. This picture here is um, six leaves that all came off of the same plant on harvest day. This plant was 10 weeks of flowering. It was a uh, Chernobyl plant. It was extremely, extremely potent. And uh, the reason I wanted to show you this is, notice there's no necrosis. There's no dying yellow spots on any of these leaves. There's one that's purple, black. One next to that is totally green. And then you have four leaves that look like the natural fall colors. This is what a plant would look like if you flowered it outdoors in nature because there's no lockup or nutrient lockout. Everything has finished like it has in nature. And that's what Vega Matrix does. Vega Matrix is 100% virtually non-burning and you get no residues. So at the end of the cycle, well, th what happens is it allows the plants to transition between each of its cycles much more naturally and much more fully so you get this natural fall harvest rather than sixth week, seventh week of flowering, the leaves get all crispy and they start to die and you're not getting a full ripening because the plants are no longer photosynthesizing because there's no green left in the leaves. So you, you want to try for, I call it a Vega Matrix fade, which is a natural fading of the plants as it would out in nature. If you don't get that, you have some kind of deficiency or toxicity in your soil, and you need to look over what you've been feeding, how much you've been feeding, and why your plants don't look like they do in nature. Um, I only have a few more minutes here. Learning the language of the plant, okay? Observation is key. The plants will tell you what they need if you are centered and quiet enough, not not verbally, they're not gonna talk to you in your ear, but they will show you things. They will tell you things, whether they need more water, whether they need more food. And that's why I say, when you first start growing, let a plant wilt, because you get these reference points in your head. That's the only way to know that you've gone too far, is by letting it happen. So learn the language of the plant by observation. One day, feed a plant what you know is too little food so that you know what visual representation the plant will give you when you underfeed it. One day purposefully overfeed the plant so that you will know what the visual representation is of a plant when you overfeed it. And once you put these reference points in your head, that's how you become a real expert gardener because you can walk into a room and you look at those plants and they will talk to you. They will tell you what they need. Um, this is a picture of some benches um, and showing you how uh, we trellis the plants out so that we don't, that the plants can't fall over. Um, drying and curing. Um, this is again just some pretty pictures of some flowers that are ready to come down. Um, this is that Chernobyl that I showed you those leaves of. Drying and curing are completely separate processes. You cannot cure a plant until you've dried it correctly. Drying the plant correctly means hanging the plant whole. If you chop it up into little pieces, the plant dries prematurely fast. And the smaller pieces will dry quicker than the larger pieces. 
If you chop a plant down whole and hang it up on a line, the, the gravity will still continue to draw water through the plant. The last portion of the plant to get water from what was the root system is the smallest buds because it's the closest to the roots. So now, if you chop it up into little pieces, those little pieces, they dry out very quickly. And when you go around to process it, process it, a lot of times those little pieces just fall apart and you get nothing from them. When you hang the plant whole, the large colas at the bottom get cut off from water days before the smaller buds and that makes all the flowers on the plant dry out simultaneously. So you get an even dry, you get a slower dry, and a slow dry means smoother smoke. The more pieces you chop it up into to dry, the quicker it's going to dry and the harsher your smoke is going to be. So hang your plants whole, then the test is roll a joint. You want to know if it's ready to come down? Take a bud off the plant, it should snap off, roll a joint, light it. If it stays lit, it's ready to process and ready to cure. If that joint goes out immediately, there's too much water, you've got to wait a little bit longer. So just use the joint test. It should be crispy on the outside, but it still should be springy on the inside. Then you're going to process it, take all the leaf off it, and you want to put it in glass jars. You want to fill those glass jars up to the very tippy top. So you have to have various sizes. You don't want this much buds in a jar this big because all that oxygen will continue to dry it out. So curing is much like canning. When you can tomatoes, you put them away, you don't open them anymore. You, you want to practice with little jelly jars. You fill them up. You don't open it up for a week. In the beginning, only wait two or three days. And then you crack that jar and you put your nose right up to it where you crack it. And you smell that odor that comes right out of it when you cracked it. And if you smell the slightest hint of ammonia, that means that there was too much moisture in that bud. You dump all those jars out, you dry them out completely, you've missed your chance to cure. If, however, when you pop that open, you smell candy, you smell that wonderful sweet smell that you want to smell, that means you're good. So you can go ahead and smoke that jar for the week and leave the rest of those jars closed. Wait another three or four days. Pop the next jar. Ammonia, too much. No ammonia, good. So then you go to the next jar. Once you get about a week or two in, and you've, you haven't opened those jars, and when you open it, it smells good, that means you've jarred those buds with the right level of moisture that you can leave them, put them away for six months, come back, it'll be in the exact same state it was when you put it in the jar, still moist. Six months later, you open the jar, you take it out. It's sticky, it's springy. In fact, you can't even smoke it. You gotta let it sit on the table for an hour or so and crisp up before you actually wanna smoke a joint because we all know what it's like to smoke a wet joint. It doesn't smoke as good. That's when you know you've hit the cure perfectly, when you have to take it out of the jar, it smells perfect, and you gotta let it sit out for an hour or so before you actually roll a joint. That's an intense cure. It takes a lot of practice. Curing is an art form. Any monkey can grow a plant. It takes an artist to cure. It takes practice. And let me say this, that, that it is worth the time because curing a cured flower, are we, are we okay? Still? Oh, shoot. Two minutes, okay. Um, I'm right at the end here. Let me just say curing is worth it, okay? They give me two more minutes. Curing is worth it because the, 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 the flavor of the smoke gets heavily intensified, and if you cure properly, you actually increase the potency. The THC molecule rotates, and you can get a few more points of THC uh, by curing properly. So practice with that. Use very small jars, small amounts, leave them alone, and you'll learn how to cure. Giving back, I created a strain for the Unconventional Foundation for Autism, the uf4a.org, if you'd like to go on the internet. That's the letter U, the letter F, the number four, and the letter A, uf4a.org. And um, autistic children are using cannabis to help themselves um, alleviate their symptoms. And so if you grow a lot of cannabis and you're lucky enough to, uh, to make a living off of it or just to have some extra, find some place in the community that you can donate uh, to somebody that will give out low cost or no cost medicine to people who can't afford it. It's really important that if you're taking something from the earth that you give something back and that's how I like to do it. Find a charity and donate some medicine. 
And that is the end of my PowerPoint. I thank everybody for coming here today. Um, do we have a, a moment for one or two questions from the audience? I'm not sure. Are there any questions? Does somebody have a microphone? Can we get like two questions? Hi. Uh, first, uh, thanks for coming. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, and for all of the people that's here, I'm Camilo from Colombia. We are working legally with medical plants. Uh, more or less 13 varieties have been studied and 900 of patients with different issues. Uh, I have two questions first. Um, the first one is in the flowering period. Uh, what do you prefer, sodio or lead? Obviously, sodio for us is sometimes better, but let uh, uh, use less energy. So what would be better, for example, if you're going to be uh, industrial way and medical way and um, no, don't use energy is the way, no? Don't well, let me say, let me say that I don't, have, I don't have any experience with LEDs, with lead. Right. Um, I do have a lot of friends that have been producing very nice flowers with LEDs, and I think that they have finally... Um, come around to the technology. Um, some of them work better than others, so do your research online and purchase an LED light that you know they spent the money to get the proper spectrum because just because it grows a plant doesn't mean that it produces all of the essential oils and all of the cannabinoids. So LED is still, you have to make sure you're getting the right one. Okay. And the second question was in the cloning part. Uh, we know that the cloning of um, plants can be, you know, can have some problems. But for example, in the medical part, you need for, um, to have the same characteristic from the mother. So the clone gives you that. You can plant different seeds from the same variety and you're gonna have always differences and uh, the concentration on cannabinoids is not gonna be the same. Uh, for medical, do you think clones can be a, a good option or is best seeds? Uh, Absolutely. Clones are essential to, to our industry. Um, and uh, I grow primarily clones. I think the point I wanted to make was that at some point when you feel comfortable with growing and you've got a, a, a system down that works for you, then it's a good time to grow some seeds. Um, or even from the beginning, just at some point in your life, grow from seeds so that you can see the difference of growing from seeds and clones. You don't necessarily have to breed, but growing from seed, it's important to see the whole life cycle, I think. You know, from birthing a baby, from a seed. Um, it just gives you a little bit more insight into the life cycle of the plant, and it's important to, to at some point, grow from seed. But yes, medical clones are extremely important to our industry. I grow primarily clones. I just like occasionally to pop a new bag of seeds because you never, it's, a, it's, it's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> yes. No, no, okay. Uh, also, thanks a lot for uh, coming. It's been a great speech and everything. My pleasure. Um, talking about the same subject uh, as the gentleman's talking about with clones. Uh, I represent an association here in, in Spain, and we're now making selection processes to, to get the mothers to then work with clones for the same reasons, for medicinal reasons, for consistency and things like that. And hopefully there'll be regulation here soon so that will force us to actually have to put like the analysis there, because right now it's, it's unregulated. But uh, do you have any specific uh, tips apart from, from when growing clones that are different from when you're growing from seeds? Hmm. Um, not really. Not really. Um, it, it's the same thing. Uh, just, uh, it's just that, um, you know, if everybody grew clones, if nobody grew from seeds, what would happen? Eventually, different um, genomes would die out, right? So it's just important that we don't forget about the seed. You know, uh, without the seed, we couldn't have clones. Um, there's really no difference. Um, you know, some clones are amazingly vibrant and, uh, and vigorous. Um, and then others, like the strawberry cough, people are familiar with the strawberry cough. 
It's been cloned for almost 25 years now, and let me tell you, it's a really hard clone to grow. Um, everybody loves it, but nobody grows it, because it's really, really hard to grow. So um, it's really important to reinvigorate it, to grow it, cross it with something, and, and bring the seeds back to life occasionally. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm certainly out of time. I don't want to run into everybody else's time. Thanks for coming, and uh, I'll be here for a few moments if you have some more questions. Thank you.